Well, as everybody continues to roll on, we'll try and stay at least within plus or minus five minutes of the schedule and keep things going with our next speaker, uh, Juan pa Pablo uh, Correa Baena. Uh, he's joined Georgia Tech just in time for the uh, COVID pandemic to hit, and so he's had a good time um, doing a lot of remote work. But nevertheless, his group does a lot of uh, very interesting work at the nanoscale revolving around low-cost semiconductors, uh, specifically perovskites, halide perovskites, and in particular, as your photovoltaic applications of those materials, as well as LED applications. That, JP, take it away, sir. Thanks. Can you hear me? All good? All right. Thanks so much for the invitation, Judd, and thanks so much for IMAT for um, giving me the opportunity to tell you more about what uh, the research community at Georgia Tech and not only at Georgia Tech, but overall uh, is doing and where, where I think uh, the photovoltaic community is heading um, as we are uh, wrapping a bunch of different things, especially in silicon uh, research. Um, I'm going to be giving an overview um, of uh, solar cells uh, to start, introduction to uh, photovoltaics, and then I'll give you a little bit of an overview of what's going on at Georgia Tech in terms of silicon uh, research, organic photovoltaics, and uh, the stuff that I do, which is uh, halide perovskites. So we, we investigate solar, uh, uh, halide perovskites for different applications, but mainly focusing on photovoltaics. And then finally, uh, tell you a little bit about the future of photovoltaics. Put this way so that you can see people better. Um, so uh, it all starts with uh, this energy challenge that we have, um, of course. Uh, we are currently consuming about 18 terawatts per year of, of energy uh, and you know plus or minus a couple of terawatts. And this is from 2012, so we're probably a little bit on the higher side of that. Um, and it's predicted that by 2050, we're going to be consuming about te uh, 30 terawatts uh, of, of power per year. Currently, most of that is being um, uh, produced from fossil fuels, which impact uh, environment. And some studies show that uh, we, we will run out very soon, although things change also. also. But more importantly, uh, geopolitics, right? So we are experiencing now geopolitics affecting our, our, our uh, sourcing of fossil fuels. Uh, so if we can come up with uh, any, uh, any way of, of reducing dependence on um, you know, uh, drilling and, 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 uh, and, and, and you know, uh, ge geography uh, specific um, resources, then we should do that. So one, of, one way that we can go around that is, is uh, looking at renewable energy, um, where we can think of, of wind in the single digit uh, terawatt uh, potential, so two to four terawatt per year uh, production, hydroelectric with four or five terawatt per year, uh, geothermal with about 10 uh, terawatt per year. And depending on which study you look at, these numbers will change slightly, but we're always thinking about you know, the single and double digit. Um, and then, of course, we go to solar and we realize, okay, we have a lot of energy that is coming in that we, that in a lot of in a lot of instances we're losing to heat, uh, and that we could we could harness. So you know, here is a, of course a very crazy number, 36,000 terawatts per year on land, and that's if we were to fill up the whole uh, planet with uh, with the whole land uh, available to us with solar panels, which we're we're not going to do. But if we focus even in small areas, a fraction of that, and um, we were able to harness some of that energy, uh, and in combination with other sources such as nuclear, when, then we, we really have uh, an advantage. So I'll be discussing mainly here solar energy and how we can harness it and, um, and what kind of research is going on. So I apologize in advance. I, I think my slides got converted from a Mac to a PC and some of the slides look a little bit different. Uh, than I had uh, expected, but that's, I think overall is okay. We're missing some colors here, but that's fine. So here I wanted to show you uh, the price of a solar panel over over time. So from the 70s, 80s, 90s, into the 2000s, and uh, and that's this this line here. This is supposed to be red, um, <clears throat> and you can see how the price of a solar panel of power produced by a solar panel decreased dramatically in the 70s. Uh, and, you know, it start, stayed pretty stable in uh, 90s and early 2000s uh, until um, 
we had another dip of, of the price of the costs in the late uh, in, in 2009. And right around this time, the production, the, the, the deployment of solar panels rapidly increased. Um, what happened here and why we didn't see a large deployment of, of solar panels was that the price was too high. The price was too high um, of the sale of a, sil solar, a silicon solar cell, a solar panel, was too high to compete with coal or oil or gas. So all the electricity was being produced by, um, uh, by some of these fossil fuel sources. But right around here, we see something that dramatically changed, which is that the Chinese government invested a lot of money in setting up large scale factories um, that, that produce uh, silicon, uh, silicon solar panels in China. Uh, that small dip in price actually triggered, and this, this, this kind of happened over a couple of years, that triggered that large change in solar cell installations. Because at that point, we arrive at grid parity. Grid parity is basically the cost of electricity of a solar panel uh, uh, arriving at the same cost of, of, of your typical electric, electricity source, like coal, for example, right? So at, that, at this point, we arrived uh, at a point where, where solar panels, installing solar, solar panels and producing electricity from solar panels was as cheap as producing them from coal or gas or, or oil. Um, so this, this was a, a large, uh, mainly uh, driven by technology advances. Uh, a lot of the research that actually was done here at Georgia Tech by the group of uh, Ajit Rohadgi uh, ended up being translated into industry. Um, and of course, many other groups in the world, but, uh, but, but this was the, the work of, uh, of decades. And then until we didn't invest billions of dollars in a, in a, in a, in a large scale plant, uh, this didn't really become viable for, for large scale applications. Um, so I wanna, I wanna bring light to two things that we consider when we're looking at, at a solar panel. Uh, one is the lifetime of the solar panel, uh, how many years they last. Uh, and another one is the module efficiency. And here we've plotted, or, I didn't plot this, I got this from a, from a paper. This is a model from, um, uh, from a perovskite solar cell. And you can see those, those lines here kind of showing that the higher the efficiency, and the higher the lifetime of the solar cell, the cheaper uh, your, your panel will be. So these are two very important things. How efficient your solar module or your solar cell is versus um, how long it will last. Uh, the more efficient, the more, the, the more long lasting, the cheaper your, so your energy from that solar panel will be. Um, but of course, uh, to arrive there, most technologies like gallium arsenide, crystalline silicon, cadmium telluride, and SIGs have spent decades uh, to have efficiencies beyond 20%. I haven't even plotted uh, the complete story here because gallium arsenide goes, goes uh, farther back and even crystalline silicon. Uh, but what, what I wanted to show you here is that these established technologies, most of the solar panels that we have are from crystalline silicon or polycrystalline silicon, uh, took decades to develop. Um, then here we have this new technology that, that we're working on, um, halide perovskites, that, that have done the same type of work, the same type of advancements in the efficiencies, but in a much shorter amount of time. Uh, see here that research started about 10 years ago, 2012, um, first published, uh, certified by an independent lab. Uh, efficiency was 15% and now we're about 26%. Very similar, comparable to a crystal and silicon solar cell. So this is really exciting. This excited uh, the research community overall. Uh, it excited the fundamental science as well because there's a lot of really interesting things to learn from this. Uh, but I wanted to just show you this picture because um, this, this, is, this is where uh, the future of solar panels as the DOE sees uh, is promising, right? Because we can make these very cheap uh, solar panels from, uh, from uh, perovskite uh, in, in a relatively uh, dirty process. Uh, and I'll tell you more about that. All right, so I'm, I'm just going to jump in uh, and talk a little bit about the work uh, uh, from uh, Professor Ajit Rohadgi here at Georgia Tech. He's from uh, Electrical Engineering, um, and he has been working on uh, silicon solar cells for uh, many decades. Uh, he also funded the uh, DOE-funded uh, uh, 
University Center for Excellence in Rural Tax Research and Education, USEP, in 92, which focused on fundamentals, fundamental science for uh, understanding defects in silicon and a lot of the things that I, that I talked about and that, that increase uh, over, over time in the efficiency of, of uh, the silicon solar panels came from research like his uh, that focused on uh, understanding what is happening in, this, in these materials and how we can do what, what we can do to improve the, their efficiencies. Uh, that, of course, also led to uh, the uh, founding of uh, a, a company. Uh, here is a manufacturing facility, in North, uh, North Cross, Georgia. Um, this is uh, Suniva, established in 2007, where uh, they have uh, uh, worked on an assembly plant to, uh, to de develop silicon solar, solar panels. Um, looking forward, and I apologize here, should be 17, 18, 19, 23. Uh, these are the technologies that the group of Ajit Rohadgi has been working on, um, mostly um, materials that are sensitive to high temperatures. Uh, they're very promising in terms of efficiencies, but they're sensitive to, to, to high temperature. And in green here, new technologies that, that uh, his group are developing is developing that focuses on um, temperature resistant uh, solar panels. And this is very important for us because we want to be able to do uh, what we call a multi-junction solar cell, we where we have a top con, uh, a silicon solar cell as a bottom cell, we deposit a perovskite solar cell on top of it, and some of these layers require high temperatures. So if you think about the traditional silicon solar cells that people use for, for a tandem or multi-junction solar cell, uh, those are going to be heat, heat cells. Heat cells are susceptible to high temperature, so we cannot use them for a tandem approach. And the advantage of having a tandem approach is that you can have two band gaps uh, that are complementary to each other, absorb most of the photons from the IR to the visible, uh, while also adding the voltages of these two separate solar cells. Uh, so we, uh, we, we have been working together now for, for a few years to try to bring this project up to speed, and we have uh, also in, in collaboration with NREL, uh, achieve a four terminal efficiency uh, of 26.7%, which is a, a pretty remarkable number considering that silicon by itself, uh, single junction, um, has a 22% efficiency. We add a 19% perovskite uh, solar cell on top and, and that brings brings that, that total efficiency higher. This is without doing any further optimization or anything like that. Um, just a couple of things that, uh, that uh, are available for uh, from uh, the, the facilities here. Just I guess I won't won't go into the details of those. Uh, and then some some of the solar cells, solar solar panels that are installed in, on campus uh, with the help of USEP and designed and installed uh, here in in Georgia Tech. A um, couple of additional projects that they're involved with in terms of solar cells here. The solar car um, that has been they've been involved with that. Um, now, moving on to organic photovoltaics, so shifting gears a little bit more about fundamental science and um, people uh, trying to explore new materials, like myself, uh, here Professor Bernard Kippel at ECE, uh, and Professor John Reynolds in material science and chemistry. Uh, they're exploring new chemistries to make these solar cells, uh, um, uh, to, make, to make organic solar cells uh, viable, and so um, let's start with um, Processing, so uh, this requires very low cost processing, such as pin coating. Uh, we can deposit these materials by, by solution. Um, but the issue is that when you have a spin coating approach, uh, it's very difficult to go into a roll-to-roll -roll process, right? So that's, that's gonna be hard because in spin coating, you spin coat one, one substrate uh, and you're not able to translate that into, into a, a industry relevant process like roll-to-roll. -roll. Uh, so that's that's going to be that's going to be hard. Uh, so his lab has been uh, the labs of um, uh, Professor Reynolds have been focusing on developing new chemistries uh, for polymers that are amenable to blade coating, slow dye coating, and spray coating. Um, and so here are some examples of that: um, airbrush spraying, blade coating, slow dye coating. All of this equipment available in their labs. Uh, and what they're doing is trying to develop some of these um, uh, polymers. So that they're soluble in different solvents that are compatible with these processes. Uh, so going from the chemistry point of view. 
um, what they do is they mix uh, a polymer uh, donor and a molecular acceptor in, in a solution, and then they, they process it uh, via blade coating or spin coating to, as, a, as a reference, uh, and then make a solar cell uh, with it to, to, to test uh, the electronic properties. Uh, and one of the things that they find is that the, the purity and the structure of those polymers or molecules are key. Uh, and that, you know, if you, if you tune the planarity of the, of, the, of the polymer, you can have a, a better deposition and so forth. Um, another aspect here and, and kind of uh, uh, tagging along the topic of, of circular economy and, and, and looking at um, uh, uh, what Kiriaki was, was talking about in terms of recycling, uh, the group of Bernard Kipelin has been working on um, uh, uh, organic photovoltaics uh, with different chemistries and different polymers, including um, uh, a, a uh, cellulose, nanocellulose uh, type of uh, substrate that is flexible uh, and that can be easily recyclable. And so this got the attention of, of, of a bunch of uh, news sources like Forbes and also the uh, Office of Science at DOE. And the idea is to use this, uh, this, this type of material, this nanocellulose type of uh, scaffold or, or substrate uh, to, to grow these different materials on top of them and, and make solar cells. Um, here is a, a first uh, attempt at actually making a solar cell with that, with that, uh, 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 with that substrate. Uh, not, an, not a very impressive uh, power conversion efficiency, but a very nice proof of concept. So 3% uh, efficiency for that solar cell. Um, but there's, of course, a lot of optimization to do here. And the point is that uh, you, you can make this, this, uh, these materials in this, in this uh, environmentally friendly substrates, which is one of the big issues that we have because we're, we're making uh, some of these this materials on, on glass. And glass is, is a little bit more, it's, it's a little bit harder to, to recycle. Another advantage of this kind of uh, substrate uh, is the, that they're lightweight, and so we, we'll be able to transport them uh, uh, much more easily than glass, for example. Um, all right, and then finally, uh, perovskite solar cells. And again, sorry for some letters missing or misplaced, um, <clears throat> which is the, the research that my group does. Um, and here uh, we have a, a, a solar cell stack where we have these two different carrier layer, uh, charge carrier transport layers, um, where uh, and th that sandwich this perovskite material in the middle. Um, this is how this is the SEM uh, cross sectional SEM of that device. We have an organic material uh, in an inorganic electron selective contact tin oxide, sandwiching this perovskite on top uh, that that is that is in between. Um, uh, carriers uh, photons are are. Uh, uh, are absorbed by the perovskite and they're extracted as free carriers in, in, the, in the device via conduction and balance bands. Uh, just a brief introduction to perovskites is a ABX, AB, ABX3 uh, structure uh, where we have a bunch of uh, uh, octahedra that are corner sharing and in the middle we have an A-side cation that sits there and kind of helps it uh, create that structure. It's the most abundant mineral on Earth, as calcium titanate and some other variants of that. Uh, and it's very versatile. We can change the, the, the chemistries to make, to have different properties. Um, so here is uh, one of those uh, examples where we can have a halide perovskite. Uh, and in the A side, we can have things as crazy as some organic uh, uh, cations, like uh, methyl ammonium or formamidinium. Uh, but we can also have some inorganics like cesium uh, and rubidium. And in the B site, the A site is this, this blue dot here. The B site is the center of the octahedron uh, where we can have lead, uh, tin, or germanium, all of them divalent. Um, and the, uh, the X site, uh, which is going to be the, the probe, uh, that those are the ones that do the corner sharing, are going to be the halides, so iodine, bromine, or chlorine. And what's really interesting about these materials is that if you change the, the halide um, from a chlorine to a bromine to an iodine, for example, you can change the absorption or the emission of that material quite nicely uh, so that we can absorb or emit light in different uh, ranges uh, and do so very efficiently as well. So um, here is, is an example of, of, of uh, 
and that there should be some color coding here, but that's fine. Uh, here, this, this uh, four last records that we, ha that we have had in perovskite solar cells have come from mixing of bromine and iodine. There's still a lot of unknowns as to why uh, mixing uh, improves the, the, the electronic properties of the material. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do, trying to probe um, structural changes and how that relates to the, uh, to the structure. So from the big picture, people know that perovskites are very defect tolerant, uh, which means that if we have a bunch of defects like vacancies, interstitials, Schottky defects, or Frenkel defects, uh, we have very uh, few electronic defects. So in most semiconductors, any of those defects that I mentioned will form uh, trap states in most semiconductors, right? So in silicon and, and gallium arsenide, um, those deep, uh, deep trap states uh, will basically trap that electron in here. There's not enough thermal energy to uh, therm uh, thermalize into the conduction band. So we, the only option that that electron has is to go back and recombine with the hole. Uh, in perovskite uh, materials, uh, this, this, these defects lead to shallow traps. Those traps are very close to the conduction and valence bands. That's because of this uh, P, uh, uh, S and P uh, hybridization modes that happen in uh, very particular in, per in perovskites. Uh, and uh, uh, that basically translates into these very, very shallow traps that allow the electron to trap and detrap. Uh, and at a room temperature be basically uh, free carriers. That translates into very long-lived uh, lifetimes, uh, photoluminescence lifetimes, comparable or even better than traditional semiconductors, with the key difference uh, that we make our materials in the lab with a uh, very pretty setup compared to, for example, CVD, which is a much, much more controlled system. So one of the, 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 the key aspects of these materials is that we can have very, very high quality properties, so very, very uh, high intensity photoluminescence, very good uh, transport in the conduction band uh, without having to be very clean. So that's what has driven this improvement in the efficiencies uh, over time, basically de this defect tolerance uh, of the materials. So I talked very briefly about this point defects my group actually focused much more in 2D and 2D defects, so what happens at crystal surfaces, what happens at grain boundaries, and what happens when we have precipitates. So we use a lot of synchrotron-based uh, characterization techniques. One example here, for example, if we're looking at crystal surfaces, um, is uh, the use of grazing incidence Y uh, angle X-ray scattering, uh, where we go and do some in situ experiments at different temperatures with different humidity conditions, and try to understand the degradation dynamics of these materials. Um, and uh, Juanita Hidalgo, a, P a PhD student in my group, and also Carlo, uh, uh, Carlo uh, Perini, uh, who is a research scientist in my group, have been developing a lot of these techniques and trying to understand what happens when we have a perovskite, uh, which has very well-defined rings. These four rings are perovskite rings. Layer on top, for example, this, this um, organic uh, material that we put on top that is supposed to um, induce some some 2D perovskite, some non-3D uh, non perovskite, non carnet sharing uh, in, the 3D, in, in the three dimensions. And, uh, in, and of course, as we expected, we see those peaks showing up uh, and uh, forming this 2D rules and popper phase. And then as we start annealing or inducing uh, or adding some heat to these materials, we see the loss of some of those peaks, um, uh, which we were not really expecting. Um, and so those 2D features disappear. We also go from a, an equals two to an equals one. So basically we're kind of changing the structure of our material at the surface. And when we continue heating up that, that same sample, we go to uh, 40 minutes now, those features pretty much disappear. Confirmed by surface chemistry analysis. I'm not gonna go into details of that. Um, and uh, here, well, in the schematic, what I'm trying to show is that when we deposit that PAI, that organic, this is the organic structure that forms. This, to, this is the 2D perovskite. Uh, as we anneal the samples, those structures start changing uh, quite dramatically, disrupting that structure. So my group is doing a lot of this, trying to understand, you know, what, what's the effect of temperature and, and, and different environments on the structure, and then correlating that to uh, the electronic properties of the material. So where do we think uh, 
solar cells are going next, uh, I think that there are two answers. One is looking more into, uh, into multi-junction uh, solar cells where we combine silicon and perovskites or silicon and organic photovoltaics uh, to, make, to increase the voltage of the solar cells so that we can extend this, uh, extend this, this, uh, this plot beyond 30%, right? Because we're, we're bound to 30% because of the shockley quieser limit which is the theoretic 33% is the, the shockley quieser limit for a solar cell. Uh, but we can actually go forward, we can, we can go further uh, beyond 33% if we have multiple junction solar cells. We can get to 66% theoretical limit. Um, so if we're able to match uh, perovskites and silicon solar cells, we, we should be able to extend this chart and be able to further uh, reduce costs of um, of this of this of these materials, of the solar panels. So that's one one aspect, multi-junction solar cells. But then the other aspect is looking at materials like organic photovoltaics and perovskite photovoltaics that require less of this high co equipment cost, right? So I, I mentioned for gallium arsenide and for, for some other technologies, you really you, you you need really clean processes, but it doesn't all only require that you have high processing costs. It also means that you have to spend a lot of money up front to set up these factories, billions of dollars. We're thinking about things like pollution-based uh, or even uh, vapor, uh, vapor processing. Uh, we're talking about things that are going to be much lower in equipment costs, much more easy to establish a, a, a manufacturing facility. All right, and with that, I would like to thank you and ask any questions. Uh, wonderful talk. Um, so, in the perovskites, um, is it possible, especially the ones that you were talking about relating to light emission and uh, the wavelength control? We looked at some perovskite quantum dots, and the uh, chemistry kind of worried us. Uh, the lead. Um, yes. Is it possible? I, I don't know. Even for solar, it may be an issue. Uh, maybe not. Uh, is it possible to replace lead and other heavy elements with uh, something a little less, less objectionable? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, a lot of the lead-free perovskite work uh, is shifting towards tin, uh, which is still a heavy element, uh, but it's it's going to be much more palatable to uh legislation and, and other things that's that's the that's the answer num number one the answer number two is that studies have shown that the amount of lead that we have in these films these are thin films 200 nanometers 300 nanometers thick so uh, what the what studies have shown because people have been trying to understand what kind of uh, effects the lead for example uh, leakage would have on vegetation uh or on, on something right uh is that because we have so so little of of that lead, um, the, the effects are, are are minimal. Of course, more studies need to be done. But I think from from the fundamental point of view, fundamental science, we're we're trying to understand this this tin, tin perovskites. The only problem with that tin perovskite uh, material is that the tin likes to be in the four plus state. So then it changes the structure, and then you have a completely different material. We don't you don't absorb light anymore. But this is actually really interesting because also we can get to band gaps of 1.1 electron volt, which makes it even more appealing that our 1.5 lead base, 1.5 EV uh, lead base. So, so yeah, there's really interesting stuff going on with this with this element. Mm -hmm.